Christo, Taub, Ishigid, um, thank you for joining us today for the What Lies Beneath panel for the Newcastle Noir Digital Prime Festival. Uh, my name is Amy and I'll be chairing today's event. Um, I'm going to introduce you to our lovely authors, starting with Alice Hawkins. Hello. Hi, Amy. Hi, everybody. I'm Alice Hawkins. I write historical crime. My series is set in West Wales and features blind investigator Harry Robert Lloyd and his long-suffering assistant, John Davis, and they ply their trade in 1850s Tybee Valley. How about you, Kath? Uh, well, hello everyone. Thank you, Amy. Um, my name is Catherine Smashwood. I write historical crime, just like Alice. Uh, my series is set in the 1840s in Cornwall and it features a detective pairing uh, of um, a young woman called Shilly, although that is not her real name. Um, and she is uh, an illiterate farm servant, uh, but with aspirations to improve her social standing. So she um, solves uh, mysteries involving uh, real crimes that took place in Cornwall in um, the 1800s with a dash of uh, folklore, um, helped by her partner, Anna Drake, who is um, much more rational. And it's a, the idea is it's sort of, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes meets the X-Files with a bit of Daphne du Maurier. That's the sort of central premise. Um, but I also write under another name, um, Fantasy Crime, uh, which perhaps we'll talk a little bit about later. Thank you, Kath. Hi, Cal. How are you? Um, hi, I'm okay. Um, yeah, my name's Cal, um, and I'm an alcoholic, and I think I might be in the wrong <laughs> Zoom. Um, but I also write uh, crime fiction. Um, I have a kind of a Balkan noir series, um, and the, the first two have been published uh, with, by Fahrenheit Press. Uh, the first one's called The Balkan Root, and the second one's called The Woman with a Bullet in Her Leg. And then The Clan and Balkan Warriors are coming out soon, I hope. Uh, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Hi, my name's Chris Lloyd, and I'm definitely in the wrong Zoom. <laughs> uh, I write a series of books set in the city of Girona in Catalonia, featuring Elisenda Domenic, who's a police officer with the devolved Catalan police force, and her sergeant, Alex. Um, and at the moment, I'm also writing a new series. I'm, the first one comes out this year. Uh, set in Paris under the Nazi occupation, featuring Eddie Giral, a Paris police detective. And I'm struggling now writing the second book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, and of course, I want to say a massive thank you to Dr. Noir and herself, Jackie, for, um, for setting all of this up. We're all obviously really sad that we couldn't do this in person, but we're glad that we could do something for you all, and we hope to see you all uh, next year. So I think, you know, we had a bit of a chat about this beforehand and we thought that we would try and do something a bit more interesting. Um, so what we're going to start off with um, is, oh, actually, no, I'm, I'm going completely wrong on it. <laughs> Let's try again. Um, the focus of this panel obviously was, was Welsh crime. Um, the, the amazing talent that Wales has in terms of crime authors, books, set in Wales, books by Welsh authors set in other places. Um, and we're actually lucky enough to have um, four Crime Cymru authors with us in this panel today. So I'm just going to ask you, Alice, to talk a little bit about Crime Cymru, uh, what it is, how it started, and what it means to be a Crime Cymru author for you all. Oh, okay. So Crime Cymru is a collective of crime writers who have a relationship with Wales. Either they set their books in Wales, they live in Wales, they are Welsh, or possibly in some cases all three. Um, we've been going since 2017 when uh, myself, uh, Matt Johnson and Amy Claverton, two other writers who live and set their books in Wales, decided that we needed, we needed something which was going to represent Welsh crime. Because when I first published my first book, my, the first book in the Tyvee Valley Coroner series, my agent had a lot of trouble placing it. Um, and I think the London-centric publishing elite, if you like, don't see Welsh, or haven't traditionally seen Wales as a very sexy place for crime. Um, I think that's changing now because of the telly, you know, hinterland, keeping faith, 
hidden, all those things have, have really put Wales on the map. And we wanted to do the same uh, for Welsh crime, you know, between the covers, as it were. Um, the covers of books, as opposed to the covers of beds. <laughs> Although, you know, well, um, so we decided... <laughs> okay. So we decided, we decided to see, so we all wrote to any Welsh crime writers that we knew to say, we think this might be a thing. What do you reckon? Shall we, shall we do this? And we had an overwhelmingly positive response. Um, so I think we've now currently got 25 authors signed up, um, all of whom are, are published um, and have, as I say, have a, a real and present relationship with Wales. Uh, we have a website, crime.cymru. We contribute to festivals. Um, we, so we, we do panels like this, we do individual events, we do bookshop events, we are available for all <laughs> events when the lockdown is over. Um, and in Stop Press News at our recent AGM, we decided that we would run a national crime fiction festival for Wales in 2022. Um, so I can't say anything more about that at the moment because it's a little bit still on the drawing board. Even the town where we're going to have it doesn't know that we're having it there yet. Um, <laughs> so, but watch this space, follow Crime Cymru. Um, we, we have a, a Twitter page, sorry, Twitter feed, and we have um, a Facebook page and we have a, a, a website. So just search for Crime Cymru and you can find out all about us and our amazing authors. Thank you, Alice. What about you, other three wonderful authors? How, how does it feel for you to be a writer in Wales? What, is it, what does it mean for you to be a Welsh writer, you know, potentially writing books set in Wales or not set in Wales? Um, do you think that you've been kind of underlooked up until this point, Cass? Uh, so they're really important questions to ask, I think. And uh, I am someone who um, is not from Wales originally. You know, I, I grew up in Cornwall, and um, it's Cornwall that, for the moment, you know, features in a lot, a lot of my writing. But I've done all of my proper job adult writing in Wales. You know, I've lived here since I was nineteen. So um, I am a writer writing out of Wales, um, even though at the moment my books don't concern Wales specifically uh, and I think for me one thing I felt very much um, since I first started writing in Wales uh, was a sense of community that comes from being a, a small nation that has a strong kind of uh, literary tradition um, and I felt I've always felt that that uh, the writing community in Wales is is strong and supportive and I, I felt that has had a big impact on my work and i then what happened when I heard about Crime Cymru, which was I actually met somebody at a poetry event at Cardiff Library and then I caught the bus home and they were on the bus and we got talking about what we did and we both write and I said, oh, I write crime novels. And this woman who I just met said, oh, you should meet my friend Alice Hawkins. She's doing this thing. She's doing this thing called Crime Cymru and I think you might be interested. And so that's kind of how I got involved. And what that's meant for me, um, Crime Cymru, is that within the, the broader writing community of Wales, which of course encompasses so many different forms um that there's this group within that its own universe which is the crime writers of wales and it's made me realize that um i'm not just out on a limb here writing crime that there are lots of us doing it and in lots of different forms and lots of different approaches and different settings and different concerns and um that that there are so many of us doing it and doing it well that um it's made me feel more confident i think that that there's a movement behind me um, and that bookshops and libraries and festivals are interested in what we have to say. So it's been really em empowering and helped me just understand a bit more of the culture that I'm working in, which has been really helpful. Thank you, Cass. What about you, Cal? Um, very similar to, to Cass, actually, in that, yeah, I mean, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't born here, but, you know, I've lived here for a long time. My son has grown up here. I work here. I, I, I have a fellowship in the university here. So, you know, I'm, I'm completely based he here in Wales. Um, and most of my writing isn't set here, although there, there was one. Um, but, but absolutely all that Kath is saying, I mean, I think it's so important about all the community here of writers. Um, and I agree about Alice, things can be quite London centric. Um, and I, I loved what Kath said, and it's so true. I, th I think for me, being part of, of this group, has been really brilliant. Um, I, th I think I must be one of the kind of groups where the kind of the mutual support of each other. Um, I haven't really felt that many other times. Um, and I, I really love that. And I think we're just all, I don't know, it's always just been really positive and supportive of each other. 
Um, um, and I also, I think to go with Alice, I, I'm thinking of a new um, slogan, um, getting sexy between the covers. <laughs> oh, we're having that. We're okay. having that. Excellent. I like um, that. I like that. <laughs> I like no, that. No, was that no from Chris? Or? I think so. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's um, it, no, definitely. It's 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 made. It's, yeah, it's, as Cav said, it's kind of made me feel. Yeah, okay. Look, you know, I'm a writer here. There are other writers here. Um, you know, at, at different stages in their careers. But you know, everyone is published writer. So they they're taking what they do seriously, but they're able to support each other in a, in a very positive way, um, and and promote yeah Welsh Welsh crime writing and, yeah, as a whole. Yeah. Um, um, absolutely. Thanks, Cal. What about you, Chris? Yeah, well, this is going to sound like I've got out of bed again, but <laughs> I feel that you have to go small to go big. And I think one of the, the nature of being from a small <laughs> nation is that you can't look in on yourself, you have to look out more. Yeah. And I think, as a, as a, and I am Welsh, but I lived abroad for a long time, I lived in Catalonia. And I think that it's the nature of being Welsh helped me empathise with another small nation, which has also made me look outward. And I set my stories, as I say, in Catalonia. And I think so much of that comes from being Welsh, empathising with other smaller nations. And then, in, and, and completely reiterate everything everyone said, Crime Cymru has, has, has been a, I think it's been a game changer for a lot of us. It's, the, the, the sense of belonging to a community of writers who really, we, we do help each other a lot. There's, there's a great deal of contact between us and a, and a huge amount of support, um, which again, you can feel very, on, very much on your own. I mean, I'm sitting in my front bedroom now yeah. and I spend most of my time in my front bedroom. And so it's rather nice to be able to, to, to be part of a group that has very much shares very much of the same lifestyle and the same, the same problems, same headaches, and same hopes. It, it, it's it's been absolutely wonderful to to be a part of, of a group like this. Yes, Alice. Sorry, <laughs> I realised in, in, in waxing lyrical about crime glory, I didn't establish my own Welsh credentials. Sorry. <laughs> so so I was born in England, but spent the whole of my uh, my childhood and youth. Um, in the area where I set my books in, in what's, what's now Ceredigion and was then Cardiganshire. Um, I, I'm bilingual, my mum's Welsh, my dad's English, so yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm Welsh, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, 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 that's my reason, and also I set my books in Wales, so there you go. <laughs> um, can, I, can I just add, it was really interesting what Chris was saying there about the idea of, 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 of being from a small nation, making one more empathetic about the small nations and it just occurred to me I hadn't really thought about this until Chris said that there but I think there's a reason I, I write about Cornwall from Wales because I, I found a writing community in Wales that made me think writing about a small nation like Cornwall where I'm from and its history was important and I don't know if I would have done that if I wasn't writing crime fiction out of Wales and I, I think that's that's a really helpful way of thinking about it for lots of us who who are writing out of Wales but like Cal as well not necessarily yeah. writing our books about Welsh things right now but it perhaps being here is informing the choices that we make so that's that's helpful for me to kind of think about it that way yeah no it's true it's really interesting I'm just thinking now as well I mean maybe all my I mean obviously I had my Serbia connection for a long time but maybe there is something about yeah, being as, as exactly as Chris said about being in a in a country, a slightly smaller country and a bigger country, and you know thinking about Serbia and Yugoslavia and look, yeah, could be connections there. Yeah, and I and I agree, and I also think it's that nature of moving from one to another, like mm. path from from Cornwall to Wales. It does make you turn around and look back at where you're from, and sort of by by focusing Cat focus in Wales, by me focusing on Catalonia and looking at the differences and the similarities, mm. made me think a lot more about Wales and where I'm from. And I think was part of what helped me what helped me gain the confidence to write or to try to write. I think from a reader's point of view, I, I obviously I have a, a different perspective to you all as 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 someone outside looking and reading your books. Um, I think that the crime Cymru has has opened my eyes. I think I I was very guilty of being very kind of London centric myself, 
and you know having met Alice and discovered Crime Cymru and having read a, a lot of the Crime Cymru catalogue I found some of my favourite books uh, and my favourite characters and not just ones that are necessarily set in Wales but I think that like like you were all saying there's something about living in Wales or, or coming from Wales that there's a sense of feeling and even you know reading books set in Catalan or the Balkans or or or, or in Cornwall there's 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 a feeling that I get from them that I think is a uniquely Welsh perspective potentially mm. um like regardless of where they're set which is which I think is lovely um you know, I'm I'm reading more books than ever by Welsh authors set in Wales or set in other places. Um, and it's really broadened my own reading horizons, which I think is lovely, because I think, I, like I said, I've been very guilty of, of being very London-centric um, in the past. And, you know, my, my shelves are, are now full of Welsh authors, which is lovely. You know, Yay. I... I <laughs> um, yeah, so it's been great. It's been... You know, I think it was. It's probably been about twelve months now. I think since since you and I met for the first time, Alice, and I've 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 read a lot in that time, and it's it's um it's opened my eyes, and I've like I said, I've discovered some some absolute favourites, um, which I would encourage you all to do as well. Go on, Quest. Well, I I was just going to agree with you as a writer, but who's also a reader. Obviously, mm -hmm. the membership of Crime Cymru has opened me up to other read other writers that I possibly mm -hmm. might never have come across otherwise yeah. and it's, it's wonderful because we all write such different books set in different locations different time periods different types of character it, it's it, it, it yes it's, it's opened my eyes to the the depth and the range of wonderful writing that's coming out of Wales mm. absolutely absolutely I couldn't agree more Okay, so I'm going to backtrack a little now to the little mistake that I made earlier. So before this panel, um, all of these lovely authors emailed me a secret. And ordinarily what we would do in a, in a, in a, in a live setting is we would, I would share the secret and ask you guys, the audience, to, to try and decipher whose secrets belong to who. Um, in this instance, obviously there's no there's no live audience, so we're going to try and work out what each other's secrets are. So, I'm going to grab my phone. I'm going to read out everybody's secrets, and then we'll come back to this at the end, and we'll see if you guys can work out whose secrets belong to who. Okay, <clears throat> secret number one. I once had four cats, each named after a TV detective. I once had four cats, each named after a TV detective. Okay, so, secret number one. Number two. I was once arrested after breaking the nose of a boss who fired my first partner. I was once arrested after breaking the nose of a boss who fired my first partner is secret number two. Okay. Secret numero, if I can find it on my phone. Number three. Okay. I once spent Christmas with Orlando Bloom and his family in New England. I once spent Christmas with Orlando Bloom with his family in New England. And then the last one, I was once ignored for nearly an hour by Salvador Dali. I was once ignored for nearly an hour by Salvador Dali. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> so there is a secret. Right. So we have a little bit of time now for you all to think about and try and guess whose who secret okay. is whose. Um, Let's get on to some of the questions, though. So I think why what we wanted to do is not do something traditional, not do something that you see in panels ordinarily. So rather than doing a reading or, or, or something like that, what I decide to ask you to do 
is to, to do two things. So to read the first line from one of your books and also your favorite line or piece of dialogue. So have you all got those ready to go? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Okay, so should we start with you, Alice? Okie dokies. So this is the first line of the first book in the Tybee Valley's Coroner series, None So Blind. There are currently three books. I'm writing the fourth now. Uh, so this is Harry speaking. There is never a convenient moment to discover that you're going progressively blind. I think I can say that without fear of intelligent contradiction. So that's, that's Harry announcing to the world and the reader that he's blind. But my favourite my favorite, um, quotation from this book, um, I can virtually do it without looking at the book, but I thought I'd better because I'm on camera. Um, <laughs> as anybody who's lived through a period of insurrection knows, once people unaccustomed to power have felt its potency, they're apt to begin wielding it indiscriminately. And it's that indiscriminate wielding of power by the usually powerless that's at the root of the crimes in them so blind. Thank you, Alice. What about you, Kath? Your first um, line. So what I thought I'd do is read uh, the first line from uh, this book, The Mermaid's Call. So this is the third uh, in my Cornish Mystery series. It's the one that's out most recently. Um, and I, I was just looking over uh, the first line of each of the books and they're all really short. They're all, they're all just a, a couple of words. Uh, and I, I think that's probably because my um, main character, Shilly, who speaks these novels, it's her point of view, um, her level of literacy is very low. Uh, so that is reflected in the style, but it, it makes a very short opening line. So the opening line of The Mermaid's Call is, the girl scream woke me. And that's it. <laughs> so very ominous, Cass. Very there you ominous. go. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> uh, so that's how the mermaid's cool starts. Uh, I think my favourite line is actually in in the first book in the series, which is this one, "Falling Creatures," uh, and um, it's a line of dialogue. And uh, what happens is um, Shilly, the main character, she's gone to to chapel, uh, a Methodist chapel, and um, a local lad called Tom Prout, who she absolutely hates, tries to sit next to her because he quite fancy. He, he thinks he's, he's gonna have his way with her so he sits next to her we well, tries to sit next to her and Shilly uh tells him uh that she would rather eat her own arm than have him sit next to her uh and um that's my favorite line that's actually something that my one of my friends uh says regularly for some things she i'd rather eat my own arm than do whatever it is and i think that it's um it's quite a good indication of the, the voice of this character because it's a bit grisly you know it's a bit it's a bit unpleasant and it's also very blunt and that's kind of she comes from a farming background she's used to kind of you know killing pigs and and um living a pretty rough life and that's reflected in the language so uh, um, yeah, there we go. Rather eat my own arm than sit next to you, Tom Prout. <laughs> Thank you, Kath. What about you, Cal? Um, okay, um, well, I will take the opening line from The Balkan Root, um, which is which has the uh, introduces the inspector. So, uh, the silhouetted fishing boats reminded Inspector Marko Despotovich of corpses that had floated down from Vukovar during the Yugoslav war. So it's just to, it's kind of to, to foreshadow uh, the sort of the crimes which will then later, later happen. So, uh, you know, the idea that he's, he's there, he's, he's starting his day, he's looking at a nice landscape, but you've got this past which is gonna seep uh, into the, uh, the present crimes, is the idea. Um, and my, my favorite lines, um, well, to be honest, they're all stolen from, from real life characters. Um, so I can't really take credit for them. Um, there was uh, there was one kind of not low-level drug dealer who um, who basically said, uh, "Those who know me, they respect me, and those who don't, they will." Um, which, <laughs> which I always love this line. I just, I just the logic of it, which is, I just thought kind of brilliant. Um, and then there's a quite a famous line um, from a sort of uh, a clan a clan boss in the '90s who described Belgrade as um, a pond too small for so many crocodiles. Um, mm. And he was assassinated a year later. Um, so yeah, the 90s were a crazy time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so those, yeah, those are my, uh, well, there's, there's a lot of great lines actually <laughs> from, from all these real life people. But I won't go through all of them. Yeah. Thank you, Cal. What about you, Chris? Uh, well, mine's the first line from 
the, this book, which is the third in the uh, Elisenda series, and it's City of Drowned Souls, so you expect water. <laughs> it begins and ends with a river, always a river. He could hear it outside, louder and angrier than he'd ever heard it. So that's, and as favourite lines, um, I think the lines that sum up your character, not my character, your character that you're writing about, <laughs> uh, are always fun. And, and there's, um, there's, there's, there's one with Ellie Zender when she sort of likens herself to her sister. And she sort of talks about her sister having an overbite that she finds attractive in her sister and a flaw in herself. Which I rather like the idea because Ella's very, very mm. critical of herself and not of others. And there's another one that one of her junior officers actually questions her and he makes a good point. And her reply is, that's very good. Just don't make any more good points. <laughs> and that's sort of her character. So we've had a, a kind of a very brief introduction to your characters here. How do you think your characters would be faring in this pandemic? What do you think that they would be doing to keep themselves busy right now? If we start with you, Alice. Uh, well, Harry's by way of being a key worker, because he's, he's he, for most of, well, the first two books, um, he's an investigator and then a stand-in coroner. And in the third book, he, um, he's standing for election as coroner. Um, so let's assume that he's, he's, he's in the second book and he's, uh, he's acting coroner. So he'd be out there doing stuff, investigating sudden and suspicious deaths um, and just getting in the magistrate's hair and the police's hair. He's not a great conformist, isn't Harry? Um, the magistrates are always trying to rein him in because he investigates way more deaths than his predecessor. So they're always saying, look, you're costing too much. You're costing us too much. Inquests are expensive. Autopsies are expensive. You're riding about the countryside and staying in inns. That's too expensive. Stop it. And in fact, in the book I'm writing now, book four, they take actual legislative steps to, to rein him in, which is annoying. Um, as far as his assistant John is concerned, uh, John has two roles in the book. He's Harry's assistant coroner, but Harry's also made him, um, certainly by book three, has made him his under steward. Um, so he would be trying to make sure that all the, the tenants on, on the estate, which Harry is squire of, um, are, are managing to cope, I suppose, in a pandemic, because they wouldn't be able to take their stuff to market, they wouldn't be able to move their cattle. Um, so they wouldn't be making any money. And because lots of the people who live there are incredibly poor anyway, um, that would be a big concern for him. But John's major, major problem in all the books is trying to rein Harry in, really, and stop him getting into trouble and uh, pissing off the magistrates, as I say. <laughs> so they'd be busy. <laughs> what about yours, Kath? Uh, well, so in the 1840s, uh, I think their experience or, or approach to pandemic, and that, that word I, I suspect didn't exist, but uh, would be di both similar to ours probably, but also quite different. So um, my main character, Shilly, um, I, she has, it must be said, she does have a bit of a problem with drink. Uh, so I suspect that she would probably spend much of uh, lockdown uh, drinking uh, to try and forget about it and cope with it, to deal with kind of rising... I'm familiar. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> Something's never changed, do they? Um, so I suspect that's what she'd be doing. And that when she wasn't drinking, when she, in moments of sobriety, um, she would probably be trying to come up with um, charms uh, and sort of um, slight kind of white magic uh, hedgerow magic type uh, things to, to, to ward off illness, not to treat it or, or, or sanitise, but this idea of kind of, of warding off, of keeping safe, of protecting a home. I think that's probably what, what she would do as a kind of a historical response to, to illness and worry and things like that. Um, her companion, Anna Drake, who is the kind of more rational um, side of the, the pairing, she would probably be putting into place the medical ideas of the time. Um, she may well be uh, trying to get everyone to social distance, to keep their distance, to, to keep things clean, um, but she would have a hard time making Shilly do that because she would be up to her arms in dirt and bits of like hawthorn <laughs> and rabbit innards, you know, and that kind of thing. So I think they'd probably be having a lot of arguments, uh, which is very normal for them anyway. <laughs> What about yours, Cal? Um, well, with my latest one, the woman with a bullet in her leg, um, 
which is kind of based really on a, on a real on a real person. Um, as she has experienced prison a couple of times, I think she would know how to cope with a lockdown. Um, and as she's uh, you know also has a past as a party girl, I'm pretty sure she'd just be having an internal party with drugs and drink, uh, to be honest. Um, but I was also thinking about uh, a, a serialization I did via, via Crime Cymru. And the, the main character there, Kelly, um, was actually an online investigator. So I think that she would be using this time to sort of investigate how everyone is doing, what's happening with all these Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. um, who's behind it all, who's making the money with all these, you know, all these tech apps and everything. So I think that's what she would be doing. Um, and seeing what deals have been made. I'm pretty sure, I kind of have a feeling that deals have already been made with universities and colleges and who has Microsoft Teams, who has the Zoom. Mm. So I'm pretty sure some, some deals have already been going down. Um, yeah. Thank you, Cal. Cal? Uh, well, Ellie Zender's a police officer, which, so therefore a key worker, and that would be her salvation, because she would go absolutely up the wall if she were forced in her own flat. She's one of these people who thinks she likes solitude and likes to be able to close her door on the world, but is actually her <laughs> worst enemy because it, face, it forces her to, to face herself. And she's not always happy with that. She's much happier dealing with other people and being quite forceful, perhaps, with other people, but she's, she's far too critical of herself to survive too long in her own company in her flat. She has a very quite a nice flat at the top on the top floor overlooking the river in Girona and I just have images of her staring over the water wondering. Mm. Yeah, I don't think so, she's too strong. The one thing she would also suffer at hugely is her family. Her family are very important to her. Her parents live outside Girona. She again she would make sure that she would be able to get to see them somehow but it, it would be her biggest one of her biggest problems is is, is not being able to, to see her family. She would also use Zoom relentlessly with her <laughs> dear Lord rue its existence. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I think the fact of being a key worker would be her salvation completely. I can certainly relate to that. <laughs> uh, as a key worker, I think I probably would have gone stir crazy had it not been for work keeping me, uh, keeping me occupied in this time. Um, okay, so another bit of a uh, sideways question. Um, if you could spend the day as a character from a book, any book, it doesn't have to be one of your own books, uh, who would it be and why? Now, we had a bit of a discussion about this earlier and some found it easier than others. I'm so glad that I'm asking the question because <laughs> I couldn't answer this one at all. So, should we start with you, Alice? Yeah, go on. This is going to sound horribly, horribly egocentric. Um, but genuinely, I would spend a day in, in, in Harry's shoes because, because I've made him blind. I've given him macular degeneration. Um, I don't entirely know what he can see. I'm forever going around, holding up my finger in front of my central vision, closing one eye and seeing what my peripheral vision can see. I mean, I've read a lot about macular de degeneration. So he's got a, a juvenile form of that. So I've read the blogs of lots of young people um, whose sight has deteriorated. So I've got a pretty good idea, but I would love to be able to actually look out through his eyes and see, um, you know, see what he can see and also feel what he can feel. Cause I obviously try and put myself in his shoes as much as possible and feel the emotions that going blind and having to go home because he was a barrister in London and he's been forced to go home to his father's estate in West Wales and he's not terribly happy about that when that initially happens although things change um, but to feel all the different conflicting emotions that um, his blindness brings up in him um, and he's just now in book four he's now just beginning to see that maybe there are some compensations as well um, and that's quite interesting for me. There's also one thing that I want to put, and that'll probably be in the next book. Um, there's a side effect of macular degeneration, which is called Bonnet syndrome, um, where you get visual hallucinations. Your brain doesn't cope well with a, 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 a bit of literally nothing in your field of vision. So it fills it with stuff. And sometimes it's just wiggly lines, and sometimes it's people, and sometimes it's, you know, other things. So that's coming up in the next book, I think. Book five. Ooh. 
Oh, very exciting. Very yeah. exciting. <laughs> what about you, Kath? Who would you like to be for the day? Well, I found this very easy to answer. And I don't know what this says about me by my choice, but I immediately thought of Lord Peter Wimsey, oh. uh, who is um, mm. Dorothy L. Sayers' detective, who just lives the, the most charmed life. You know, he's, he's, um, he's a sort of gentleman detective, so he, he solves cases for fun. He doesn't need the money. So there's no pressure if he, you know, doesn't, doesn't solve it, doesn't get paid. Uh, he spends his days going to clubs in London, um, having wonderful dinners. You know, he's got his, um, his manservant who does all this washing, does all this cooking for him, you know, sorts himself out. He, he, um, has, he has the best of both worlds in that he gets to solve mysteries, but he's not financially dependent on it. And he doesn't suffer like many contemporary detectives do, which is, you know, their relationships fall apart. They don't, they go without lunch, they never tend to eat. <laughs> You know, they're terribly yeah. tired, they develop health problems and that, that they that get aggravated and they never get to sort of sort out. And that's true of my pair of detectives too, who really get put through the ringer. But Lord Peter Whimsey just sort of glides through <laughs> gilded London, you know, and I just think, and maybe it's also part of uh, lockdown as well. I think, God, I could go for a lovely fancy lunch somewhere. <laughs> you know, that, that sounds yeah. great. Um, so yeah, I, it, for me, it would be Lord Peter Whimsey. I think that's that's a great idea. But doesn't that sound lovely right about now? Yeah. Going around and having a nice lunch and being taken care of and not having any, you know, real life things to deal with. Yeah. Um, Sign me up. Sign <laughs> yeah. Up. Yeah, me too. Me too. What about you, Cal? Um, well, I was thinking about the devil from Master and Margarita, um, <laughs> because, uh, because, you know, just because of all the powers <laughs> that he has. <laughs> But then yeah. I thought, okay, that's not really crime. So I'm yeah. going to go for uh, Karen Sisko from Out of Sight by uh, mm -hmm. Emma Leonard, because um, she's just so cool. I mean, she, she, she just <laughs> she's just such a, a cool. I would like to be her. She's such a cool character. Um, obviously, that was made into a film as well with Jennifer Lopez. Um, the book's even cooler, and she's just she's just cool. <laughs> <laughs> so she, you know, she she sort that she sorts out crimes. She's driven. Um, she also, you know, but she does fall in love, um, and she finds her own way of dealing with that, you know, while, you know, having to put away the guy who she kind of falls for. Um, so it's got a bit of sort of that doomed romance, I guess, I <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> or have in my life forever. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You, <laughs> that's it. I'm done with. Oh. Just, yeah. Go on, Chris. This is one I really struggled with. I really didn't, because I sort of thought, I, I like Harris using her characters. I, I wouldn't dream of using my characters. I give them far too horrible a time. They <laughs> <laughs> really hate me. Um, so, and then, then I started thinking of, of, of some great heroic character like Jean Valjean or something. I think, yeah, but that means you've got to spend long times in a French prison. Which is, yeah. <laughs> so I sort of came down to two. One of them is Gulliver. I just like the idea of being Gulliver all the travels, all the different types of people, all the different ideas, all the different worlds he's exposed to. Just what a wonderful thought. And I thought, no, Eeyore. <laughs> <laughs> all the day long, no one expects any more of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it would be Gulliver. It would be Gulliver. Like I said, I, I... I'm so glad that I'm asking these questions rather than answering them. I, I, I did try to, to think of, of who I would like to be, but I just, I couldn't. There were just too many options. So obviously, you know, you're all crime authors. Um, I should imagine that you all read quite um, a variety of books, though. You don't just read crime books. So if you were to write a crossover genre bending novel incorporating some different genres. I mean, obviously, some of you already have crossed those elements with historical and, and things like that, but what would you do? What genres would you like to write next, if you could? Alex? Gosh, I'm not sure I could write another genre, to be honest. I mean, I, I do write medieval fiction as well, mm -hmm. um, which isn't strictly speaking crime, but it is definitely mystery. Um, 
I've tried writing contemporary stuff. I'm just bad at it. My writing seems to lend itself particularly to writing historical. I guess if I was going to do something completely different, I'd do time travel. So that I could still write oh. historical a bit. So <laughs> then I'd be able to, because what I wanted to do in my very first book, Testament, was try and um, have a character in the present day solving a mystery in the past, allowing her to move forward in the future. But I also wanted to show all the kind of mistaken assumptions that she made about the past. Yeah, because I've always looked at these um, archaeology programs and they make all that, they say, oh, this was a ritual significance, or oh, this was used for this. And you think, you don't know that. That's just a <laughs> massive assumption. And I wanted to show her making a lot of wrong assumptions. But that doesn't matter. She still manages to move forward. So the only person who really knows what happened uh, in the book is the reader because they've seen the both halves. So it wasn't, strictly speaking, time travel. It was just um, two different time periods. But I think if I did write a different genre, yeah, maybe time travel would be, would be it, just to take that kind of idea a little bit further. Mm, interesting. What about you, Kath? Uh, well, I, I, as you say, I, I've already, I seem to do a lot of this kind of genre bending stuff because mm -hmm. like Alice, I do uh, historical crime. So that's bringing sort of two genres together. And latterly, I've been writing fantasy crime, uh, which I do under um, the name DK Fields. And I do that with my other half, Dave. Um, and that's, that's been really great experience to have the sort of the plot the plot generation, the plot movement that comes from a crime plot. So we have a police detective um, who's got a murder to solve. You know, it's quite kind of like a gumshoe detective. Um, and that's to then um, use that to animate the fantasy world that we've, we've created. It's been fantastic. Um, I've been really excited by that, sort of what happens when those two, for me, come together. Um, so what we're thinking about doing next as DK Fields is maybe a space opera. Oh, wow. uh, so yeah okay i mean you know it's easy to say that isn't it Just yeah. space, uh, we haven't started it yet but we, we kind of like the idea of uh maybe moving dk Fields into kind of a more of a science fiction space and having a space opera but it would probably still have the kind of the crime plot generative qualities um yeah. so with something like the expanse which some people might have seen on tv um yeah fits that model um and I, I i i really enjoyed that so um that's kind of what i'm thinking next maybe kind of sf for me that would be a massive leap mm. i also I, I love the idea of writing a psychological thriller i don't know if i've got it in me really but I, that's if i could if i could have a crack at something and do it well <laughs> i think that would be i'm always just so in awe of writers mm. who do that because they often take you to a very dark place in the psyche mm. and mm. and they couple it with a tremendous like pace the pace is really frenetic and, and there are lots and lots of really big twists and reveals and you know I think that would be a really cool thing to say that you've been able to do so yeah that's my ambition. <laughs> Sounds brilliant how do you find writing with another person? Awful someone generally. with control issues I think I would <laughs> really struggle with that. It's really tough yeah I mean the first book uh, which I you know I can just wave at you because I have got it here just so you can see what it, it kind of looks like um but yeah, it, the first book, uh, which became Widow's Welcome, it took us about five years to write and we rewrote it, remade it, completely broke it apart, changed it in all sorts of ways. And that that was hard writing because we did we did have lots of arguments and things that we thought we had agreed on in discussion. Of course, when one person actually went away and produced that scene, it of course, we envisaged it completely differently um, because our imaginations are, are different. And actually, we thought our styles were closer together than they actually were. Um, mm. So we did have an awful lot of rows. I'm not going to lie about that, but we're still going out. Uh, so that's all right. Um, but ultimately it was worth it because we created something that we couldn't have done independently. And so, and we kept going because we got a three book contract. So we had to write two more. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, we have to contractually, we have to keep going, but we yeah. learned a huge amount in that first book. So we've learned what not to do to annoy each other, basically. Thank you, Kath. What about you, Cal? What kind of genre bending book would you like to write if you could? Um, well, I mean, all of mine are kind of contemporary, um, but the last, the and contemporary crime, um, but the last, the last one I've just written is is definitely slightly sci-fi. Um, although it's although it's set now, there are sci-fi elements in terms of the, of the concept of it. Um, so that was quite a new thing for me, uh, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I also uh, wrote a novella, which is slightly supernatural. Again, it's, it's set now, but again, just coming into the concept of it um, is a, 
an idea that of kind of a powers that kind of emotional powers that people might have, which are slightly more than reality. Um, so again, that was just very interesting to be to going into those. Um, uh, I, ha I have been told that maybe I should go into erotica. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, maybe that's where the money is, so maybe I should try that. Um, and I'm, I'm also thinking of romance. I don't know, I always have these doomed, tragic romances. So I'm trying to, I'm, I want to have some, instead of heartbreak, although I have got an idea for a novel called The Heartbreakers, um, but maybe it can have a happy ending. So, <laughs> that would be good, that would be good. <laughs> for once. Yeah. Um, so, but, but actually, seriously, maybe, maybe I can cross a bit of romance. Hmm. Yeah. Thriller, yeah. romance, yeah. bit of comedy. Yeah. <laughs> bit of everything. <laughs> Thank you, Cal. Yeah. What about you, Chris? I'd, I'd like to try and write something that, that has an alternative history, a crime series Ooh. set in alternative history. Yeah. Like The Berlin Wall Never Fell. Yeah. Or An Ooh. Independent Wales, a book set in an independent Wales and the relationship with, with England. Uh, or the Romans never invaded, but something, or the, the Romans never colonised the, the Britain. Um, but something that, that, that sort of marries a crime story with that alternative Ooh. history. The, the, the what if this happened yeah. or this never happened. Mm. That, that, that's sort of bubbling away somewhere. And the mm. other one is, is art, but not mm. sort of books about art crime, but crime stories set in paintings Ooh. In, so that mm -hmm. sort of take a painting take a renaissance painting take a, a, a Vermeer or Rembrandt or something and create a crime story based on what's in that picture wow. and what's not in that picture interesting that, Great idea. you know listen to you all talk I'm, I'm in such awe that you know you come up with these ideas uh, you know, I'm I'm a huge reader. I read really widely. I'm a, I'm a voracious reader. I just don't think that I could do it. Um, so thank you very much for feeding my clearly. <laughs> you have a problem, you know, maybe. <laughs> this is not the half of it. No, I know. This is not the half of it. Um, so I'm always in awe, you know, talking to authors who who come up with such ingenious ideas. Um, to keep me occupied. I mean, I admittedly in the beginning of the lockdown, I had a bit of a reading slump where I didn't really want to read anything. I couldn't concentrate. And I'm back into the flow of things. And I think, what would I do during this time without books? So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm sure. Go on, Carl. Go on. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just thinking about those ideas of uh, ideas of Chris's, uh, which are you know brilliant. Um, and I, I think the other thing I have been thinking recently is about new kinds of storytelling. Um, so, I mean, you know, obviously we all write novels, um, mm -hmm. but I think there's, there's a lot happening about, you know, whether it's audio, uh, whether it's yeah. serializations, um, mm -hmm. there's all kind of like immersive and interactive storytelling happening now as well. Um, or, you know, all kind of bite-sized stories for apps. So I think, I think there's a lot of stuff to really explore as well. Um, which is not exactly genre, but maybe format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, absolutely. I think there's always, there's always going to be room for uh, for change and for development and for, for things like that. I mean, audiobooks, obviously, they're, they're having their moment at the moment and, and everyone's listening along. And I think, you know, there will be lots of other ways that people consume um, stories in, in different ways. Um, I remember a couple of years ago where there were discussions about bookshops no longer existing and books not coming in physical things anymore because everybody was reading ebooks and that just doesn't seem to have materialized which is great because I think it's nice to have options as to how you you know how you read um whether that's through audio or ebook or physical or serialized or, or whatever okay I'm just gonna quickly check back in with my questions um I'm also conscious of time mm -hmm. um I think we had 45 minutes and I think we're kind of starting to get along now to the to the end so I want to make sure that I don't miss anything um very briefly then in a couple of sentences I want to ask each of you one thing that you love about writing crime fiction and one thing that you don't love as much so I'll start with you Alice one thing I love about crime fiction um I love the way in which it provides a perfect wrapper 
to to investigate a social circumstance or a particular event or a particular kind of time. Obviously, I write historical crime. So my first book is about the Rebecca riots. And I didn't want to write a straightforward historical book about the Rebecca riots because I knew I'd just pack it with all sorts of research. Bad idea. So but setting a crime which took place during that time, seven, and I set the book seven years later, so that, you know, the actual event is very broad brushstroke but the effects of that are felt all the way down the line. And I love the way that, that crime um, enables you to look at the effects of the times that people are living through and the events that people are living through, because we're all a product of our times and the events that we live through. So I really love that about crime. It, it enables you to, to investigate society, whether it's society, you know, contemporary society or historical society. Mm. And I was thinking about, the things I dislike about writing crime fiction. There is nothing I dislike about writing crime fiction. It's just that sometimes writing any genre, you have bad days, you have hard days. You think, oh, um, Ian Rankin describes it as the, the page 60 phenomenon. You get to page 60 and you think, this is a whole crock of you know what. I, why are you <laughs> writing this book? It's a terrible, terrible idea. I don't have that then. I have it when I'm going through doing the third edit. And I'm thinking, oh, I know this book so well now. I am so bored by it because there's nothing surprising in it, you know. So, and at that point you think, why? Why would anybody want to read this book? And then you have to kind of give it to your partner or somebody and say, can you just remind me why you liked this book so much? So it's, it's really that aspect of writing, which is hard rather than writing crime fiction, I think. But generally, it's a wonderful um, genre to write in. Thank you, Alice. What about you, Kath? Um, I think for me, it's, it's this, the same thing is the thing I love the most and I also dislike. Uh, and that's um, the plot uh, expectations, if you like. So the kind of the generic characteristics of a crime plot. Uh, however, whether it's a fantasy crime or historical crime or a contemporary thriller, whatever it might be, readers, contemporary readers of crime have certain expectations about how that plot is going to be arranged, um, what what certain things will happen when and about the denouement and, and things like that. And that's both, I think, the saving grace as a writer because it for me it gives me a, a structure to work with. So I can plan and I, I have to plan to be able to start. I've got something to work with and I've got footholds and I can find my way and I, you know it's I'm w working through all the crime books that have come before me, you know, I'm working in a tradition and that's really helpful and inspiring and technically supportive. And yet you're then totally restrained by that. Uh, and you, you're, the expectations of readers for a book that is marketed as a crime book, you then have to make sure you hit those points and you, you create a satisfying um, uh, wrap up the, the conclusion that everything is seeded where it needed to be, but it wasn't too obvious. Uh, all the kind of the delicate balances of, of a crime plot are really hard. It's really, really hard. So it's both the most helpful thing about it, but it's also the hardest thing to do. Um, so that's, that's for me. And that's, I guess, also reflected in what I both love about it, but find least satisfying as a reader is when it's done well, a crime plot is absolutely almost like miraculous. You know, but but when it fails to fire at the end, when the payoff isn't there, it's so disappointing. Mm. <laughs> In a way yeah. that other novels aren't. That you yeah. know, that a, mm -hmm. a bad crime book can let you down more than a, a bad historical novel. I think. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of where I sit with it. Thank you, Cal. What about you, Cal? Um, well, I'm going to take the, uh, the things that both Alice and Cass have said. Um, so I agree that the, I mean, the plot, I mean, the, it gives you a natural plot pretty much because as soon as you've come up with a sort of a concept for a crime novel, you know, you've got, okay, who killed who or who's going to find out the murder, or whatever, you've, you've kind of got your plot almost set out. Um, and, and I'm very big on plot. I use all my index cards, things I use kind of from screenwriting, et cetera. So, um, and that's, that is great because it, it does really help you give a plot, but at the same time, um, and I think I've been guilty of this sometimes, it can kind of make you then plot focused rather than character focused. Um, mm. So I think you have to kind of be wary of that. Uh, and then the other thing, I'm a completely agree with Alice about how, you know, using a kind of a crime, crime fiction to, to show society as a, as a wider thing. And definitely with all my book and stuff, you know, that's what I was trying to do. Um, 
because you know I wasn't I wasn't trying to say oh look all these Serbian criminals you know it was it was like okay why did all that happen I mean you know and, and in the 90s you know there's, there's very clear reasons you know there was the only thing which worked was crime because there was no economy um, and the West the West is a huge amount to blame for that you know they they bombed Belgrade they put sanctions um, so you know if you've got a, a country which, where nothing works and that could happen to any of us. You know, what happens after the lockdown? What if exactly? What if it happens now? <laughs> um, yeah. You know, yeah. we will at some point. We will all start turning to crime because if, yeah. if that's the only way to survive, yeah, then yeah. that will have to be what you do. Absolutely. I think. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm crossing my fingers that I don't have to turn to crime. I think okay. uh, <laughs> the, 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 the obviously, job that I do. Obviously, uh, love does get you through as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah of course, I believe. of course. <laughs> Unless it, unless it does it tear you apart, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris, your favourite and least favourite things about writing? Uh, yeah, the, the favourite is very much what, what the others have been saying. It's such a versatile genre. You can tell any story you want, any issue, any subject, any period, anything. You can tell it through a crime story and you can tell it in a certain way that maybe other genres don't might not allow the other thing i love about it is that unlike real life there's some form of resolution yeah. <laughs> which you which real life just tends to keep muddling along whereas in in the crime story again it comes back to to cat's idea of the, of the plot expectation that that there is some sort of resolution to what happens mm -hmm. which when again the pandemic when there is we don't know what resolutions to anything are going to be it's yeah. rather satisfying to find something yeah. where you do get that yeah. and i think that's Absolutely. one of the things i find satisfying that versatility and that resolution mm -hmm. rum dislike there's a frustration and it comes back to the plot thing and it's because crime genre is so reliant on things meshing together and on sewing thing layers into the story as you go along it's that moment when you come to the damn this doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> you think, oh no yeah brother, or something and yeah. it just doesn't work and you've then got to go back and unpick and try and find a way to solve it which yeah. then does take you to one of the immense good things when you do solve a plot hole and when you do solve that frustration and that's one of the best moments in the <laughs> definitely yeah. definitely brilliant okay one more question and then we're going to go back to the secret uh, and see if you guys can work out whose secret belongs to who um i've played a couple of events and the one question that i ask every time without fail um is what would your three desert island books be now desert island books in terms of books that you will always cherish, books that you reread time and time again, books that you refuse to lend out because they mean so much to you. Um, I've had quite a few uh, interesting discussions um, about this question, so I'm hoping that that's what's going to happen today. What about you, Alice? Let's start with you. Okay, um, they, they're very, very different, the three books, um, but they are all really important to me in different ways. So the first is The Outsiders. It's a young adult novel by S.E. Hinton, which I read when I was a young adult. Um, it was, oh gosh, it was the, the touchstone of my life. It couldn't have been more different than the world it conveys. It's, it's, it's gangs in America, two, two rival gangs. It's a bit of a kind of... Um, Romeo and Juliet story in a way, but it's about a, a family of, of parentless brothers who are in one gang and, and how one of them falls in love with the girl in another gang. Anyway, um, I read that again and again and again and again as a teenager. And despite the fact that it was about a world, or perhaps because of the fact that it was about a completely different world, uh, I just loved it. I loved the way that you got inside the characters. Um, it's not a crime book, it's not a mystery book, it's just about the people. Um, so that's one from ages ago. Then there's the historical, um, the historical novel Year of Wonders by Geraldine Brooks, which is about the 1662 plague. Um, it's based on reality. There was a village in Derbyshire, Eam in Derbyshire, where they quarantined themselves to stop the spread of the plague. It all seems terribly relevant today, but genuinely is one of my absolute favourite historical novels. So Geraldine Brooks took 
a one line mention of a person in, in one of the historical records, um, the vicar's servant wasn't even named and she tells the whole story through that person. And it's just brilliant. It's like a masterclass in historical fiction. Um, and the other one is poetry. The thing which really suddenly turned me on to English literature, the songs and sonnets of John Donne, the metaphysical poet. I, I kind of quite liked English at O-level. You can tell how old I am. O-level, not a GCSE. <laughs> um, uh, but then I started doing A-level. The first thing we read was the songs and sonnets of John Donne, and it blew my tiny little West Wales mind. Just the breadth of the world, the breadth of the language, the kind of sheer inventiveness of John Donne, and the interesting life he'd had as well. Um, and I go back to those poems again and again. And, and A, I always see something new in them, and B, they remind me of a time in my life where anything, anything seemed possible, you know, when I was 16, 17. Um, so yeah, those are my three books, three very different books. Thank you, Alice. What about you, Kath? Uh, this is a question I found the, the hardest. I, I really did, and, and I loved as Ireland Dis, and I'm always, the bit I'm probably most interested in is people's book choices right at the end. Fascinating, <laughs> but I, I still, oh, I still find it very hard. So I'm, I'm going to be one of those people who says, well, I cheated slightly, uh, which <laughs> <laughs> forgive me. Bad um, but I have, uh, I have at home a complete set of Virginia Woolf's diaries. So I think it's either a five or six volume set and they are so rich uh, and full of wonder and insights um, into her writing. I'm a huge admirer of, of Woolf's work and she was, uh, she's a, a writer who's been very important to me, um, both as a, as a younger person, you know, like Alice was saying, but also latterly. Um, and so in those diaries, they give you such an interesting understanding of, of her creative work, but also just a, a creative mind and a, a mind that worked in in a unique way, as do as do all minds, but the, the way she was able to excavate and talk about and understand her view of the world is astonishingly rich. And so those diaries are are crammed full of stuff. And I, I, I feel confident on a desert island that I could go back to them, I could read them front to start and then go back and read them again immediately because you get something different from them every time. So uh, those would be my desert island books and I, I just also would never lend them to anybody. <laughs> and generally I'd lend yeah. anything to anyone and I do yeah. it all the time, yeah. I, you know, and I'm continuing, surprise and you, oh no, I didn't get it back, you know, what yeah. was I thinking? But those Virginia Woolf diaries, I wouldn't lend. So that's me. Thank you, Kath. What about you, Kath? Um, well, if we're going for whole sets, uh, can, oh, yes, yes. can yes, I have uh, the Cartel Trilogy? Yes. Um, uh, if, no, I'm... Okay, I'm, I will have to have something by Elmore Leonard because he... Um, I mean, A, because I, I, I love him, but also he was one of the first writers who made me sort of turn to crime. Um, as it were. So, yeah, as, yeah, yeah. I feel like I would help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I once I once read that I think uh, Tarantino that uh, the only thing which he stole in his life was a book by Elmore Leonard. Um, <laughs> That's uh, a cool anecdote. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah, it would have to be one by Elmore Leonard. I think maybe Rum Punch, uh, which was turned into Jackie Brown. Um, it's again a very really cool character, but obviously played by played by Pam Grier in in the movie. Um, but it's just the great the the dialogue. Um, you know, he's always brilliant with dialogue. Um, and characters, the way he all, mm. the way he balances characters and plot, I think, is, is just masterful. Um, so, Rum Punch, I'm guessing by Elmer Leonard. Um, I'm going to take The Getaway by Jim Thompson uh, for its uh, surreal, um, surreal ending of um, of trying to be of trying to get away as gangsters, just for the sort of irony of being on an island with that. Um, <laughs> and I think our master and Margarita. Um, because a bit like Alice, it was a book that I really loved when I was young, um, and it does sort of take just takes you to this whole. Although it's although it's got its setting of Russia, uh, it just you know it takes you to this whole other world. And I think as a writer, he was you know, able to take you somewhere completely else. Mm. You know, you have a person who can just transform into a cat. You can have a uh, the devil who can just do this, and you just think, okay, wow, I could actually do anything with my with my stories. Mm. Um, so those would be my three books. Thank you, Carl. Uh, lastly, Chris. Um, th th this is what it is struggling. I had a page full of the books. <laughs> three, what, three pages or three books? <laughs> I think 
my first, I suppose, as a crime writer, I would go for The Daughter of Time by Joseph oh, K. Oh, yeah. Which I think is just the most perfect crime story. Mm. Um, and, I mean, the, the book actually made us think again about uh, an era and, and a character in history. And it's a perfect book for the lockdown because the detective is there bedbound as he's as he's solving this crime. It, it's, it, you know, it shows that it doesn't need amazing action or mm. car, what have you, car chase, what have you. It, it, it's just the perfect crime story for me. Um, next one. Hmm. I suppose, thinking of Carl, what Carl said, got him into writing, what maybe started me off wanting to be a writer as a kid was The Silver Sword by Ian Soralia, yeah. which is just the most beautiful story. It's, it's about um, uh, refugees in Europe after the Second World War in Poland and, and people trying to find their families, children trying to survive. And it was, I suppose it was just at that age, the impact you know, we, we were so used to all these amazing Hollywood war films, but it was just reading a book that showed the impact on children, on ordinary people, mm -hmm. and, on, and on that strength they, they, they had to call on. And it, I think that's possibly one of the, probably the book that made me as a kid want to be a writer. And the final one, I'm torn between two. So <laughs> I'm going to go all Cal, I'm going to go all romantic. <laughs> and the Le Grand Moulin by Alain Fournier. Oh, what a novel. Yeah, it's, it's, I read it when I was about 17 or 18, and it's just this most beautiful lyrical story of longing and lost love, <laughs> and mm. find love. Um, and it, it, it just brings me to tears every time I read it. Yeah. So I think that's the mind. Yeah. Do you know, Chris? I, I actually thought of reading it recently uh, during lockdown, and then I thought I'm just I'm, I was actually, I was too sad about things. I thought if I read it, I'm going to cry. So I just I just refused to read it. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sort of toying with the idea of reading it, but yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Mm. Well, I love this question. I always end up leaving with recommendations of books that I haven't read before yeah. that I know definitely need to read, um, yeah. which is always great. Um, so thank you for that everybody. So before we finish, back to the secrets. So I will read out the questions, the secrets again, and um, let's see if we can guess who is who. So who do we think this one belongs to? I once had four cats, each named after a TV detective. Who do we think that is? Cat. I think it's Cat. Alice for double bluffing. <laughs> a good one. Spoken like a true crime author there. <laughs> what are you thinking, Chris? I'm gonna go Kath. Yeah, Kath. I'm saying Kath. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that is me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my cat does. My current cat does. Speak, who is one of those? Or does feature a lot on social media? So that's right. <laughs> that's me. Okay. Next secret. I was once arrested after breaking a boss's nose, who fired my first partner. Who do you think that is? I think that's Cal. I think it's Cal too. I'm going to go for Cal's double bluff. It's Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Cal? Uh, I think it's Amy. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. No, I don't have a secret in this one. I don't have a secret in this one. <laughs> Um, so who, who was it then? Uh, Time to confess. Okay, it was me. Yes. Ah. <laughs> yeah, after I'm after I messed up and told more. my first secret to everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we had. Um, I, I I asked everybody to send an email with their secret, and um, Carl sent it to everyone. So it was no longer <laughs> secret. Okay. <laughs> So next one, who do we think spent a Christmas with Orlando Bloom and his family in New England? Well, it's going to be, it's either Alice or Chris. Yeah. I love your deduction abilities. I think it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Alice. I think it's Alice. Hmm. 
I'm, I'm trying to look in their eyes. Um, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard on me. What kind of bluff was that by Chris? Why I think it's me? Is that a triple bluff? <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chris has got a much better poker face than me. I, I actually say. did. I actually did think it was Chris, but I'm going to go with Cass and say Alice. Yeah, it was me. Ah. Oh. I have to say, it's not as exciting as it sounds. He was ten. And his mother was at the time going out with my ex father in law. So, oh, wow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Who knew? That's pretty cool. I think, I think, uh, yeah, no, I, that, that's uh, regardless of who was 10, I think that's pretty cool. So, what was your secret then, Chris? Seems you're the, you're the one left. Well, I've, I've just realised there's a painting behind me <laughs> <laughs> by Salvador Dali. I was ignored uh, for an hour by Salvador Dali. Right. I was supposed to be, I was going to interpret um, and the person I was going to, to, with Dali and some other people and the person I was going to interpret for didn't show up. So I was sat at the, around this table with Dali and he, ju he just, he just blanked me. It was like I didn't exist and he was elderly by this stage. He wasn't talking much to anyone and he just sat and it was, it was like, I was invisible. I've never felt so invisible <laughs> in my life. And of course, he was a hero, or is, is a hero of mine. Mm. So oh. it, it, it was quite oh. a straight, and I spent all the time in, in completely superfluous. There was no need for me then. I spent all my time looking at him <laughs> out of the corner of my eye, and he was just staring. <laughs> Maybe he was trying to kind of give you some sort of surreal experience. You know? But I think I was surreal <laughs> or unreal. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Well, there we are. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank um, you, Amy, for yeah. joining us. Um, I think we've potentially gone a little bit over time, um, but I think that's kind of to be expected when we have <sighs> such uh, such chatty authors with us. Um, <laughs> thank you all for joining us. Um, we hope that you enjoy the digital um, Newcastle Noir Crime Festival, and hopefully, we'll all see you next year. Fingers yeah. crossed. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.